Well, hello everyone. Um, it is your brother Hampton from Hybrid Calisthenics. I am super excited to do this podcast interview with Ben Patrick, the, aka the knees over toes guy, and his lovely wife here. Uh, ben, thank you for being on. How are you doing? We're good. My wife and I are big, big fans of you, so we oh, just likewise. love your vibe. So we're super excited to chat. We're super excited to chat and share anything we can, you know, based on the questions that your subscribers ask for us. And yes, this is my lovely wife, Alyssa. She is the brains that runs the business. I know the workouts. <laughs> she knows business. And then that makes sure that, you know, we're able to provide a good service for people. Thanks. That's the perfect team. And I uh, really appreciate both Alyssa and Ben being here. Again, Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy. Uh, go check him out. And I'll say at the end um, on all his social media, YouTube, TikTok, everywhere. Ben, I... It was interesting because even before we did this podcast, a lot of people asked me about you. They said, hey, uh, have you seen Knees Over Toes Guy talk about this over that? I'm like, yeah, I'll check it out. So just like the um, the permeation you have into just like the public mind that looks up like fitness videos on YouTube, I think is relatively high. Just like someone from like Walmart is talking to me. We're having a casual conversation and they bring you up and like, yeah, this guy, this guy really helped me. So that was That's kind of how I was introduced to, to you. Walmart. So <laughs> right, that was right. A, yeah, like, my goal was to right. get into casual conversation at Walmart. You know, some people want to get their product into Walmart. My goal was to get right. into casual conversation at Walmart. So I'm glad to know that. Oh, I, absolutely. I, that that's like that's the standard. You know, it's like if, when you <laughs> if you're in the Walmart produce section, you know, and five hours <laughs> people know you, that's 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 when you're a celebrity, man. That's when you're a celebrity. <laughs> so I was so that was how I was introduced to you, even before I think I ever saw your first tiktok video which is where I, I think i first saw one of your oh, wow. i'm like oh it's, it's the guy it's the guy um and they said well this guy really helped me he increased my mobility and i was a little bit confused just based on just the, just the name of it so could you give some background to our listeners over what you do what your philosophy towards fitness is and why you are the knees over toes guy absolutely uh knee pain started ruining my life when I was about 12 years old. So this just built up and built up and built up. I had three surgical alterations. Basketball was my life. And a lot of people know if you get into basketball, maybe before you've hit puberty and you're way too obsessed and you're training too hard, I think this could happen in just about any sport. You can build up overuse injuries. So coming along, I was fully taught, you know, don't ever let your knees over your toes. So I, I did everything I was told and nothing was working. I was very weak with my knees over my toes. So basketball, every time you take a jump shot, every time you try to get down to play defense, your knees have to go over your toes. So basketball became this, all I wanted to do is be good at basketball. Yet basketball was like my source of pain and misery for so many years, especially in my, in my young teens, you know, when things should be fun and, and stuff like that. So I didn't reach my goals of, you know, getting a college scholarship or things like that. And then I was about to turn 20 years old and I started being taught uh, that it's actually the guy whose knee can go farthest over the toast and strongest over the toast. That's the most protected. And the person putting this data out, his name is Charles Poliquin. Rest in peace. He trained 286 Olympic medalists. So he had a ton of experience training athletes, and he just had an opposite approach of the better your knee can go over toe, well, then the more protected you are. And, and it's like everything I just lived through like finally made sense. She was with me at the time. So she was with me when I couldn't do any of these dunks that you see. My dream, you know, was to be able to dunk a basketball and get a college scholarship. Well, that's exactly what I did in my early 20s, years after, you know, I, it should have happened in high school. So I, I never gave up. And then I saw what I could do. And you've been with me. Have I ever missed anything for my knees in like 10 years now? No. Like I used to ice my knees but, four times yeah. a day. I had painkillers in my car stashed where no one could see them. Like, I didn't I, even know about that. How honestly. long did we spend foam rolling wow. just to do any exercise? Yeah, it was his whole day consisted around like one workout and his knees because of everything that had to do before the workout and after the workout. He would and, and ice yet, his knees driving, yeah. foam rolling, back pillows, like just everything that you could ever imagine. And still couldn't play basketball. Right. <laughs> so, on, on no teams or anything. <laughs> so you could see I'm still harboring a lot of passion just from what I went through. And then knowing, so when it came mm -hmm. time for me, I was already a successful coach in person, having tremendous results. I wasn't even on social media. Mm -hmm. So what you see on social media, right. people think it's, people think my social media growth has been fast, but 
that's because I was actually doing all this stuff in person with hundreds of people getting amazing results in a small town where no one had heard of me. So when it came time to go on social media, mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm going to be the knees over toes guy. She thought it was, it took a couple. Of <laughs> I, I still laugh at the name. <laughs> Like I get, and now I'm knees over toes girl, and I that was her choice, not right. mine. That's never even my idea. That should give <laughs> an idea. That should give you an idea how badass she is. Some people probably assume I like forced her to be knees over toes girl. That was her idea, not my idea. So she's very supportive okay, like that. Okay. I'm supportive, but I still laugh at the name. You know, it's just it's, right. it is what it is. But and your it's mom, incredible. knees over toes, mama. Yeah. <laughs> well, she doesn't have Instagram. And your mother, yeah, knees over toes, mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like but, that. The point is in my mind was like, I don't have to be everything. If I can just help work on this one myth for people so that the 12 year old me with knee pain would have known that he could actually do something about his knee pain rather than just ice or rest here, kid, don't play your sport, ice your knees, take these drugs. Like that 12 year old me needs to know that he can actually work his way. It's totally up to him with his own efforts and his own training. Mm -hmm. He can choose to not have knee pain with his own work ethic. So by, by having the right tools and knowing that your knees can go over your toes. So we'll get into this in detail, but I can break down level by level, you know, like how this applies because something as simple as walking backwards, if anyone watching this mm -hmm. stands up, looks sideways in the mirror and tries to take one step backwards, your knee is over your toes. Right. In elderly, In elderly, this has proven to be an effective screening process for falling which is one of the leading causes of death and hospitalization in elderly. So right from mm -hmm. just essential to life is that ability to have our knees over our toes. And then we know that in a step down test, like going down the stairs, yeah. well, the, the stronger you are going down the stairs, like in a step down test, less chance of knee pain and knee surgery. So my system literally builds up like this kind of step-by-step step from walking backwards or for athletes dragging a sled backwards. We try to rack up 100 miles in a two-year period. And then every Monday, we work on those reverse step ups, like getting better at going backwards up the stair, basically. And then every Wednesday, we work on a split squat, which you know, split squats, lunges, but we do it yeah. all the way, ass to grass, ATG split squat. And then Fridays, we work on a deep knee bend, which I've seen you have one of the best videos teaching people that. So there's there's the rough there's the rough copy edition of, of Knees Over Toes Guy and what I do. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm surprised at how... You know, where I, I, I think I see a lot of people debunking the myth, so to speak, of like, it's okay to have your knees go over your toes. Yet every video where I do, even, even, even if it's not about squats, you know, I'm just doing a squat just to keep the video interesting. People will tag one of the creators or they ask a friend, it's like, is it okay to have your knees go over your toes like you do in that video? And I'm like, yeah, in fact, it's encouraged. In fact, some people with long femurs, I, I don't think it's possible for them to do a deep squat without their knees going over their toes. But it's what's interesting to me is that you said one of the reasons why you chose to be the knees over toes guy is because this was such a, a major clicking point for you. Even at 12, you already had knee pain. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, at 12, I can distinctly remember it would take me about half an hour just to warm up to like play sports. So I couldn't just go out to like recess like the other kids and play sports because my knees were so stiff and so, so painful. Now, keep in mind, I was from the time I was nine, I was training like up to six hours a day. So when you don't have the muscle okay. tissue yet, you, you can mess up your body real quick. You know, if you, if you totally overdo certain motions at a young age, like if you want to find like the worst, most painful elbows, you'll find it in probably like 12, 13 year old kids who play tennis, who are like totally overdoing it. You know what I mean? And then not strengthening the muscles, you know, mm -hmm. year after year after year. So it was kind of like that for my knees. And then by by the time I was in high school, then I had three surgical alterations to my knee. What differentiated you from your classmates and your teammates? Was it just because like you went that much harder and you practiced that much more? That much harder and probably with really poor genetics to be doing those kind of motions of jumping and stuff like that. You know, my dad could never, you know, jump okay, up and grab the rim. And so I'm sure different genetics, you know, you're starting out maybe at a better point for a certain sport, right? Like think about gymnastics, right? Now imagine a, imagine like a tall skinny kid in class and then he's like trying to do dips and push-ups like a mofo at like six, seven, eight, nine years old. It could either go really good or it could go really bad. You know what I mean? And so for me, it went, it went really bad. But also if you tell him how much you weighed and how tall you were. Yeah. I mean, I went into high school at 92 pounds. So like 
the puberty wasn't there yet. Yeah. Okay. The muscle tissue wasn't there yet. You know what I mean? So my knees were just getting destroyed. Right. And I was doing every, I was doing every plyometric program to jump higher, you know, every program that says jump I got higher. You. I was, I was doing that. And if you know, Ben, he works like crazy. So he's going to outwork everyone else. So the nine-year-old Ben is doing what even an adult wouldn't do in a work life. <laughs> like he I'm going to, I'm going to overdo it. Yeah. So really it better be, <laughs> yeah. it better work out well. <laughs> Cause if there's something flawed in it, you know, it's going to manifest. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's dive right into that because some people watching this will have kids around that age. Some people watch, yeah. like it might be someone around that age watching this right now. What would you do differently? Um, if you were 12 years old again, with the knowledge that you have now, would you do less or would you strengthen yourself first and then do more? Yeah, I just would have changed what the training was, right? So okay. if you look at the best athletes, some things that might come to mind are, you know, like Nordic hamstring curls, right? A famous body weight mm -hmm. exercise. Yeah. So there's plenty of viral videos. There's a guy anyone can look on the internet. I think the most viewed Nordic video ever is a guy named Tyreek Hill, AKA Cheetah fastest guy in the NFL jacked out of his mind. He can do 10 of these Nordics, you know, in a row. Right. Wow. But every kid could start doing that stuff. Every kid could have a, a, a Nordic bench set up. You see what I mean? So there's definitely like some simple yes. things that everyone could agree on. And that's an exercise that even that's the one that most physiotherapists reach out. And they're like, thank you for promoting that. Because even if someone's like anti knees over toes, I haven't met anyone mm -hmm. who's anti being strong in your eccentric knee flexion, because that's how your ACL attaches from the back of the thigh to the front of the shin bone. So your ability to resist on the way down of a Nordic is the exact same protective mm -hmm. mechanism of the ACL. Better your Nordic, more protected ACL. So that's just a simple example that as a kid, you could start that shit now before you get all jacked up. You know what I mean? Simple example. Interesting. So yep. that's one of the one of the many things you would do differently is you would do those Nordic Hamstring I'd have a Nordic bench in my house. Yeah. I would have been like one of the fastest kids in America <laughs> rather than having some of the worst knees in America. You see what I mean? So it's really a choice of, of right. what I'm choosing to put the energy on. You know what I mean? Is it breaking my body down or making it more fortified? And that's a good point. Uh, when you mentioned that you could be one of the fastest kids in America, do you think, um, there is a time limit on when we start doing this, like the earlier, the better, and then you will be able to realize more potential or is it something you can start relatively almost any time let's say in your youth um, and still reach your potential? I mean, only time will tell. I'll say that right off the bat, it's pretty cool that people see me doing all this crazy stuff with my knees and I was the worst knee guy. You know what I mean? And I didn't start this until much later. Right, right. So, so I went through all my good hormonal development without knowing any of this stuff or doing any of this stuff and yet have still gotten, really athletic my speed is on par with the average nfl wide receiver not the fastest but not slow right you know on par with an average nfl cool. wide receiver i jump as high as an average you know nba point guard so for someone with like horrible genetics for sports and athleticism you know i'm living proof that someone could change that you know maybe at a later age but if you're 70 are you going to dunk now <laughs> you know what i mean i don't know but maybe at 70 you could right. still Maybe at 70, you could still have pretty great mobility and athleticism for a 70 year old. I think there's no doubt that if someone were to start this young, you could pretty much manufacture, you know, an Olympic athlete. Okay. Yeah, interesting. So you think just about anybody could be an Olympic athlete in your opinion? That's actually with what the right I think. training. Yeah. That's actually what I cool. think. And cool. The, cool, the cool thing is there's case precedents for this kind of stuff. So there was a guy who did Nordics every week for about 20 years. And his name, and this is just mm -hmm. one exercise, right? The Nordic, right, right. the Nordic pulls the ground. You still have to have the force into the ground. So it's kind of a, you know, your speed mm -hmm. is going to be a combination. Well, how much force can you put in relative to body weight? And then how much can you pull your stride? So that would be your knee flexion and your hip flexion. So we also mm -hmm. load, we care about that. Like I measure how strong, you know, people can pick up weights with their feet. You know what I mean? It's a huge one for us. So the point is there's a guy named okay. Jonathan Edwards, a guy named Jonathan Edwards from England did Nordics once a week for about 20 years. He went to four Olympics. So here he is with gray hair in his fourth Olympics. He won a gold medal. He just kept getting faster. Guess what his sport was? Triple jump where you get a running start and he had the fastest entrance in history. And then you get three bounds. It's literally like the most Nordic sport of all time. He kept training them. He right, right. Them <laughs> other people do push-ups. 
and he won a gold medal with gray hair in his fourth Olympic cycle. And he was so bad genetically, awesome. his country wouldn't. Yeah, his country wouldn't sponsor him at first. Their orthopedic specialist looked at him and they said, "It's physically impossible for you to be a triple jumper." His world record still stands today. Wow. What year was that? 1990. It was in mid 90s. I think 95. He set the wow, world. Wow. So that's something in there. Wow. So that's that's quite a while. Lots of athletes have come and gone since then. So yeah, 25 plus years. Pretty good for a guy. Right, who right. is physically impossible, according to people who specialize in studying bones and muscles. Sorry, it's physically impossible for you to be a triple jumper. World record still. So now you can see I start out pretty boring and lazy, and then I get way too passionate because of shit like this. And because me growing up, I, no, no, I wish I would have known good. stuff like that because everyone was telling me, you can't be a basketball player. You can't dunk. My own high school coaches bet me money I would never dunk. They didn't think it was possible. I didn't know about guys like Jonathan Edwards. You know what I mean? I wish I knew mm -hmm. about more of these cases that proved that it's actually more in your control than you think. Anyways. Okay, so here's here's an interesting point because we do have some athletes that are watching this. Oh, cool. Um, you're talking about being able to run fast, jump high, uh, things that <clears throat> athletes care a lot about depending on their sport, really almost just about every every sport. How would you distinguish the benefits of a something like something like a Nordic curl? Because it's just one exercise. You do a lot of them um, to work the hamstrings versus, say, a deadlift, which everyone does. Yeah. So the, what the kind of benefits are you getting gonna, from that? So the deadlift is going to overload your hip extension, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be one component. Uh, I put a video last week. I do double body weight on Romanian deadlifts, getting my lower back below parallel with my knees behind my toes, behind my ankles. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm knees over toes, but I'm right. just a strong knee behind toes. So the mm -hmm. amount of people who can do double body weight on a strict Romanian deadlift for reps, not that many, but that's just one at hip extension is one aspect of speed. You also have to extend your knees okay. when you get going. You also have to flex your knees. You also have to flex your hips. You also have to flex your ankles. So traditional weight training thinks about triple extension for athletes. Like when you do an Olympic lift, that's like triple extension. That's great. We train. Mm -hmm. So your ankles flat, like your ankles extend like a calf raise would be an ankle extension, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a squat okay. would be like a squat would involve knee extension and hip extension, right? A deadlift would be mostly mm -hmm. just hip extension, right? That's, that's great. Right. The better those are, the more your potentials. But I also train triple flexion with measurable axi. How strong can your ankle flex towards you? That's key for deceleration, which prevents all the overuse injuries, shin splints, patellar tendonitis in the first place, which holds back a lot of athletes because you're injured. So you can't even express your max intent and force. My dog just like jolted okay. when I did that. <laughs> My dog <laughs> went like that when I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then same with like the Nordic. The Nordic is only knee flexion. It's only one part of it. But the deadlift is hip extension. Mm -hmm. So the fastest athlete would be the best at both of those and the best. So for me, I tested hundreds of athletes with laser timers and yeah, the guys who could deadlift, like okay. the fastest guys were very strong at hip extension, but they were also really strong at hip flexion, meaning they could pick up their leg with also greater strength than the slow guys. So even if the slow guy matches the genetic fast guys deadlift, he's still going to have slow feet by comparison. Because even if he can generate the power, he's not going to be able to pick up his leg fast enough. So Japanese researchers found the number one difference between regular humans and elite sprinters was hip flexors. How strong are the muscles that pick up your own leg? So that's hip flexion. Interesting. You have hip extension, hip flexion. You have knee extension, knee flexion. You have ankle extension, ankle flexion. So the truth is simple. So you have six lower body qualities, not three. So most people, even if you match, like, why wouldn't every Olympic lifter just go beat Usain Bolt in a 100 meters? They're the strongest at triple extension. And yet you have all these kids in sports going and only training triple extension and not training triple flexion with the same measurable accuracy and intent. So their bodies get destroyed because the harder you can triple extend, the more you can F up your ankles, shins, knees. That's your ability to express the power, mm -hmm. not handle the power. Triple flexion handles your own power. So the harder you can deadlift, the stronger you better be in a Nordic to actually handle that deadlift behind the knee, for example. So everything, all six of these factors 
hip extension, hip flexion, knee extension, knee flexion, ankle extension, ankle flexion, all six of these factors, you would want to be strong and balanced from one to another. And you can manufacture athleticism in the lower body. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and even beyond people who aren't looking to be athletes or just like aren't really interested in sports, knee pain is just a very, it's a, it's a huge issue. You know, like who doesn't have knee, just about everyone has knee pain. And especially as they get older, this person, this person has knee pain, that person has knee pain, this person has knee surgery. What, you know, outside of athletics, do you think humans were meant to do naturally that we're not doing now that is causing that knee pain? Because I mean, I mean, yes, we could do Nordic curls, but someone who may not have access to equipment or some tribes in Africa, what are they doing naturally that we in modern society are not that's causing that knee pain in your opinion? Knees over toes by far, number one. So we, we, okay. we prevent that quality from <clears throat> developing, you know? Um, and even into our elderly, we have them doing all kind of, you know, chair exercises, but not actually getting stronger with their knees over toes, which is where the pressure is on the knee. So it's really that simple pressure on the knee. Well, you would need more ability to handle that pressure. So the American way of training is to avoid the things that are hard rather than facing them. The trick is to face them, but ah, to find what yes. you can do, but in facing something, right. Dropping someone from a ladder and telling them to land with their knees or toes. If that causes them pain, that's not an exercise in my system. I'm just saying, if you're working through pain, you're also not really facing your problem either. You're wincing, you're shying away from it. So the only, the only true facing of a problem is addressing it at the level you could do without any pain. So the, the better you Absolutely. get with your knee over your toe, the, the stronger and less pain you have with your knee over your toe, the less knee pain you have. <laughs> I'm going to bring this up because I can envision the comment section now. People are typing this. If they're listening to this recorded, they're typing as we speak. Good. Good. Is there any kind of pain that's okay when you're building up? People say, I have a slight pinching here. Should I work through it? Oh, I have, oh, here's another thing. Some people say, I don't have any pain in my knees, but I hear some popping. I hear this little, little crack. I hear this sound. Should I work through that? What is your opinion on that? Totally. So you have the science that's been done on it versus what I'm doing. So I don't just adhere mm -hmm. to what I often think things can be done a little better. The science is that working through a two or a three on a 10 scale of pain still works. You mm -hmm. go above that, the science okay. shows it's not going to work. You see what I mean? So working through a two or a three on a pain scale, science shows still works. However, in my experience, working through a two or three doesn't work nearly as well as finding the level you can do without any pain where it actually feels good and you want to do it and it feels great. You see what I mean? That's where I found that lead. Yes. Plus the studies are always short term, right? So what I do is I'm training for life. Where are you going to be two years from now? But the studies are on six weeks of this, eight weeks of that. Life isn't a six or an eight week study. So yeah, pushing through pain for six, eight weeks might make a little more change than not for six, eight weeks, but you also might wind up with residual chronic issues that don't ever quite seem to go away because you're always learning to push through pain. You know what I mean? So my whole thing is figuring out how to train without any pain. So we have things, and that is where some of this gentler stuff, like these tibialis raises, where you're not even bending your knee yet. However, you're working the muscle right under your knee. So you don't even have to put pressure on the knee yet, but you are strengthening an area and getting blood flow through the knee to help reduce pressure on the knee. I mean, every step we take, your heel goes into the floor. So the stronger the tibialis, the less pressure on the knee. Every time you decelerate in sports, your heel slams through the floor. Strong in tibialis, less pressure on the knee. This would be an example of something that you can work at a total zero and you can take that muscle to the point that you're screaming in the you know pleasure of a good burn of a workout. You know what I mean? Like there's a difference. Between <laughs> okay. <laughs> screaming and pleasure of a good workout. Of a good workout. <laughs> okay. Quote that and just put, um, that on your, put that on the wall. Ben says, work until you scream, dot, 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 in pleasure. <laughs> I'll have a um, What about sounds? I'll help out though with this because I was a little more hard-headed at first and she was very insistent on this working through no pain. This was not his uh, natural philosophy. Maybe three, four years ago, I followed the mm -hmm. work through a two or a three, right? Okay. He used to say like, what do you, he was just work through pain kind of thing, like, just keep going and eventually the pain will evaporate because you, you know, 
made the muscle strong. <laughs> Very common in, a- in athletics. Yeah. You know, uh, anyone who's doing sports, I yeah. think, is to push through the pain. Yeah. I'm always surprised at how how many people think that. If I'm watching someone do push-ups and they get up, I'm like, how did that feel? It's like, well, I'm in intense pain. I was like, well, why, did you, why didn't you stop? <laughs> They're not saying anything. I, like, I see like a slight twitch of their eyebrow and I, I lear- I've learned to ask, sir, are you in... in- immense pain. They're like, yeah, I am. I said, well, stop. <laughs> Let's do something else. It's like, it's like you said in a video. Yeah. We it's like you said in a video, video you yeah. have the muscle and then you have the joint. So I call this internal versus mm-hmm. external. So we actually try to take a little slower approach and let those internal gains develop. So when you do like a, like a mm-hmm. deep knee bend, you're also stimulating the tendons, the cartilage, the ligaments. So theoretically you could push through pain, make the muscle stronger, but where are you going to be a month from now? Two months, yeah. three months. So I was Alyssa had a cartilage issue. And I was just like, I'm not working through pain. He'd be like, just keep going. And I'm like, no, like I won't. I like that probably was one of the main things that I've yeah. helped ATG with because I, I refused to go. She refused to work through, through pain. any pain. So what so I have to do, had I had to figure find out things for me to do. An average step is six inches. We want six inches to be really pain free on all our reverse step ups. We do various ones with the where there's a slant board or no slant board, but a, a normal step is going to be six inches, right? So that's what kind of led it's like a no brainer, but like, okay, if six inches hurts, do four. Not don't let your knee over your toe now and wind up through a miserable life ahead of you with knee replacements. You know what I mean? Uh, America is, we, mm-hmm. lead, we lead the world in knee replacement. Like we're the worst at knees by far. Like we dominate. If being bad at knees was like a subject, America wins by far because mm-hmm. we're just the king of gold don't medal. Let, <laughs> don't let your knee over it. any kind of problem. Don't just avoid, just avoid it. Don't, right? <laughs> no, the, the problem at a six right. inch, if that hurts, is to do a four or a two or assisted. So our whole, our whole system is built on scaling. You have the range of motion and you have the load and you mm-hmm. can go negative load by using assistance. Mm-hmm. So we've yet to find a single okay. person who couldn't do the system. You see what I'm saying? Because it's about right, right. Skating it here. But now, and everyone we're talking about, like my mom, like yeah. my sister, like his and, and, mom, every anyone. But now you put in the work and you get some muscular adaptation and some tendon adaptation and ligament, and then you bring those up gradually together. So it's a really good rule of thumb not to work through pain. But we have all these little tools and tricks and exercises where you can get a really good workout with a zero of pain and then it just gets better and better. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you do get a little stronger, a little stronger. So the whole system is built on mastering your body weight. Yep. Then we don't just mm-hmm. go from body weight to then just how much weight you can lift. It's master your body weight, then master like 5%, 10 like then you, it's just gra- incremental. And so, yeah, some, I see. It's very similar. Like how you teach the push up. I love calisthenics yeah. <laughs> enthusiasts probably understand my system maybe better than any other type of, you know, fitness enthusiast, because Mm -hmm. you have to handle your own weight. So you're, you're, you're not thinking of training as this, like all or nothing, the way maybe someone who's used to powerlifting, maybe they think, Oh, if I can't squat 400, then I shouldn't even like work out today. Or, you know what I mean? Like it's, there's a bit more of an all or nothing, but we, I mean, just yesterday, a guy who squats 875 pounds, 875, he just sent me very high. A thank you. He just sent me a thank you message for these exercises because now he's able to do his powerlifting without it hurting. So it, it's really for everyone, but the trick is not working through any pain. And the trick is understanding that in knees or in life, whatever you have like the most trouble with running from it is going to lead to a long-term disaster potential, even though it may seem easier now to avoid it. It's better to start facing your right. problem on an incremental mm-hmm. basis rather than if you're in debt all at once approach would be going to vegas right that would be trying my hardest exercises day one would be going to vegas i mean it really could work right. <laughs> but it's not <laughs> it could <laughs> and then the other approach would just be to be madly in debt and like flee the country and i don't know you know that would be no knees over toes just flee the country flee your debt change your name yeah. <laughs> I mean, that okay, could okay. Work. It could work. I understood the metaphor at first. <laughs> the metaphor got more complicated as we go. <laughs> so we went, yeah, it could, That's but it probably won't. As soon won't. as you start talking a different analogy, then people will criticize your other analogy with what's wrong with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, how do I give a comp- <laughs> Absolutely.
actually it's strategic to go into debt. Yes, we know we get we get it, you know, with the financial. <laughs> Sometimes, yes, you can leverage that. that so yeah, don't think too much <laughs> into it. Just go knees We're over not... toes, guys. Just go knees over toes. <laughs> I work with knees. I don't work with with finances for you. So, but but the point is, with any kind of problem, you could see that if you avoid the problem completely, it could turn into like a really disastrous situation later, and that's where. Yeah. Once you even have one surgery, honestly, I see it can really mess people up for the rest of their lives because now you have the scar tissue and now maybe something else happens and you start overcompensating on another side. And now you don't realize that your, your ACL tear now leads to tendonitis, which now leads to now your back gets thrown out. You see, it's so it's just, it's a nasty cycle. Once you go down that road of, uh, you know, of no knees over toes and avoiding the problem, you know, and, and winding up with really, right. Right really weak tissues, you know, when that occurs. And so you even have how you explain the muscle and the joint you even have on the flip side, you have guys who, who don't train knees over toes, but they do certain bodybuilding or strength methods that they look good. Like these athletes these days who look, you know, they look good, but they're just blowing out their joints all the time because you actually have anabolic mm -hmm. properties in your tendons and ligaments. You have anabolic properties, just like a muscle, but no one's showing off their x-ray. Like, dude, have you seen how jacked my patellar tendon is? I'm fucking yoked. <laughs> like, it, no, it's not. No, it doesn't. You get my point. So yeah, yeah, so yeah. It can get pretty rough out there because we don't see, we don't, we don't see our knee health. You know what I mean? So it's good to have measurables. Absolutely. What can you do pain free? Life could still be hard, but it can be a lot, can be so much easier on the knees, you know, than is thought with traditional exercise, traditional rehab. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things stood out. The first is that you've worked with many, many people now, and you, you said that you have not found a single person that could not start with something they can do and work their way up pain-free. Yep. Correct. If the person right. can so, walk, like anybody the watching this, can, there's probably here's something why. for you. Here's why. Cause if the person could walk into my gym, then they can walk backwards to some degree. And if you can walk backwards, then you can put <laughs> You can put a little bit of money in the bank for your knee. I like it. I like it. If you could walk backwards, you could probably drag a half a kilo on the floor, right? So I would have old ladies and I would be mm -hmm. pushing the sled for them as like negative weight of yeah. even what the sled weighs. And they would be pulling the sled backwards to strengthen their knees yep. until they could pull the sled on their own. Mm -hmm. So it, it is all just degrees of ability. If the person can walk in the first place, there's structural defects and you know what I mean? That would be the only case mm -hmm. if there's a structural, if, if the person doesn't have functioning limbs, barring, barring right. stuff like that, which I've still tried yeah, my best, yeah. you know, he still, still tried people, my best but... people have one leg yeah, or yeah. this or that, you know, I still tried my best, but like, you know, we are, when I say everyone, I'm for, referring to people who are born with and haven't been in any like accidents that they lost limbs and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or paralyzed. Absolutely. I've tried to something paralyze. Like people you know that's much tougher than right absolutely and i mean that's not just because you can't cure them doesn't mean that your system didn't help especially on the internet where you never really because if you're in a room you can see who you're talking to on the internet you know the it might your video might reach a million people and you're like yeah anybody can do squats and then someone with no legs says well about <laughs> what about me so like that's why i've like always added a caveat i was like yeah you can't do push-ups if you have working arms if you have you, <laughs> most healthy people can do push -ups, so. you you probably get that because of the you can do push-ups my friend and probably someone writes i actually cannot do put you know you get like that one person who writes in that they can't but right but, i had a little like yeah it's you can with an asterisk <laughs> um exactly. given that you have some prerequisites yeah um but that's also an interesting thing because you mentioned structural defects and surgical routes is there a point of no return like if you if you, someone's watching this and they have gotten those surgeries or they've done perhaps something that's that's wrong um is there a point to where you just can no longer fix this after they've done surgery so number one is that's something that being in fitness you have to avoid kind of like the plague you, you have to avoid saying anything on a medical diagnosis basis right in my i can only mm -hmm. explain my case or people that i've worked with one of the best things that happened to me is that the surgical alterations were only to one knee. The other knee had just as bad mm -hmm. of damages and tears that I should have had surgery. But by that point, 
I was like mm -hmm. way too depressed. I'm just like, I'm not having surgery. So I got to experience both okay. sides of it. And when you have a surgery side, stiffness can really hamper things. And when you have a, a side that has tears that hasn't had surgery, the, the looseness mm -hmm. of it can be really problematic. So that actually led me to make a much better system than if I hadn't had surgery or if I had only had surgery because I, I had to live with both knees. So even if I mastered one ingredient that helped one problem, it might not handle the other one. So the trick with the knees is to get, is to have them strong and able to be stable, yet also able to be mobile. And, there's no, there's no. And balanced. This is a super and balanced from thing. one leg yeah. to the other leg, from one ankle to the other ankle. So it forced me to get balance between sides mm -hmm. and to get strength and range of motion. So a lot of people see my flexibility now and they're like, oh, what if I'm not flexible like that? Neither he was I flexible. like I was, my I mean, nickname was the old man. That's the whole point, you know? So with your knees, yeah, there's no advantage to being weak and there's no advantage to being stiff. You want to be mobile and strong. So that's all I can really say on it. Whether someone has surgery, they'd have to consult a doctor. We're not, we're not at a day. Oh, of course, of course. We're, we do have, I do have one guy, um, who is a doctor and someone can look him up, uh, on Instagram because he's called the ATG doctor. Our business is called ATG athletic truth group, but also, you know, it's synonymous with ass to grass. So the ATG yeah, doctor yeah. is someone that I don't pay him anything as a person, you know, as an employee, he's just his own man, but he's someone who he was one mm -hmm. of my original online members has done my system and now is graduating this month as a doctor. So I think he just graduated as a doctor of physical therapy, who is someone okay. who could at least point someone, you know, in the right directions. There are, there are certain studies that may indicate if it's this much of a tear, you don't have to have surgery. If it's, you know what I mean? So there, there is some public data that people can do some digging. I put an article on, I put a lot of free articles on medium and I wrote one and it was just something about facts on surgery. So I just wrote up a bunch of facts on surgery <laughs> so that someone could look that over and they could even mm. take that to their doctor because in some cases, doctors have proven to be as much as 75% wrong, meaning they're not up to date with the latest research. There's been certain surveys and it's been found that only 25% of the doctors are actually up to date with the truth on that topic. So someone could take this list of facts that are up to date and take it to their doctor to help make a decision. That's the best, you know, you can see I've, right. I've tried to address this the best I can and still be ethical about it. I've lived surgical and non-surgical and had great results either way. And in both cases, it was just a patient route of not working through pain. More, more ability has never proven to be, if you have more pain-free ability, it's only proven to help. Even if someone is going to have surgery, some doctors will advise to do this kind of stuff, you know, as prehab before the surgery or whatever, but only a doctor could determine, yeah. you know, to have or not have a surgery. One thing that I thought of too, is that <clears throat> Ben's body right now looks absolutely nothing like what it did at 1920. He had skinny legs and a big upper body. And he's literally like changed okay. his entire body structure, the whole thing in the last 10 years, like just shifting it to could, be strong right, from like, the feet up. So the more strength you have from the ground up, the less pressures come up through the body. But like he has calves now okay. that my calves used to be like way stronger than his. Um, like from my ice skating, I'm serious. Like, I had I had one of the weakest lower bodies you would ever imagine. Hence, such bad knee problems at such a young age. You know? Totally, a very thin leg. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But if someone could just like decide, like I want to have bigger quads and this and the smaller arms here and not whatever. He like literally designed his body almost through this time, and it would be something. If I could say what you wouldn't even imagine is possible, truthfully, like looking back on it, mm -hmm. you. Would tell someone that's impossible. You can't literally take this fat and muscle and add it here without surgery, take this right. and add it here. But right. that's literally what he did. And maybe, you know, there's photos. I don't think he has them on Instagram now, but like from, you know, seven, eight years ago to now, you wouldn't recognize him. Truthfully. I had a really big upper body because I was trying so hard to get, remember I went into high school, 92 pounds. So every coach was like, you got to get bigger. Right. You got to get bigger. You got to get bigger. So everything grew except my yeah, legs because yeah. there was so much pain that 
I couldn't get into good leg workouts. So my body wound up like a, like a reverse Christmas tree, big at the top and small at the bottom. And so I, I basically, it's, it's true. I basically skipped upper body. For, <laughs> I skipped upper body for many years. Now upper body training is about 15% of the volume strategically in the ATG okay. system. Someone could do more, right? But my job, hmm. my job is to deliver certain things. The workouts take 30 minutes. Someone could easily add on more. So in delivering this, mm -hmm. upper body is 15% of the volume because about 85% of your okay. speed and jumping and, and knee protection is going to be in the lower body. And then about 15% is going to be on really mobile power, you know, pound for pound, strong upper body. So our goals become things like full range of motion, dips and chin ups, which are built on, you know, using, we don't press dumbbells like this. We turn them this way and get a full range of motion. And we do exercises to get deep okay. into the shoulders. We do exercises for the thoracic spine and for the quadratus lumborum. And, but we're, we're trying to be built from the ground up. So yeah, anyone could, anyone could take my system and use it as like a lower body and spine and shoulder bulletproofing system. And they could still add on more upper body volume, you know, if they wanted it's, it's pretty fluid, but the, the system itself is only 15% upper body volume. Okay. Okay, cool. And just to add on really quick to something you mentioned earlier about the surgical route. Yes, absolutely. I, just, I mean, I completely agree. We, even if we were doctors, even if we were knee doctors, we're not your doctor. If you're, if you're listening yeah. to this, you know, yeah. Yeah. someone has to, has, someone has to be there in person. They, you know, we're not, we're not advising definitely don't go, don't go surgical route because we don't know. We don't know you. Uh, we can tell you what's worked for us, but absolutely we can't say don't go, uh, don't do surgery because we don't know your situation. My question was more directed towards people who have already had surgery done to them. Um, oh. Is there a specific procedure they could have had done where the system may not work for them to where they cannot progressively build up because they had something removed or altered that you know of? I mean, <clears throat> I think that the more surgery there's been done, the more the range is going to be limited at first. But if you look at something even like the Nordic that we were talking about, right? If you even look mm -hmm. at something like that, when, when you load tissues like through an eccentric contraction, you can actually lengthen tissues. So we do this on either side of the leg. So whatever the mass is inside the knee, it's going to feel less tight as you gain more length in the tibialis and the quad and the hamstring and the calf. So it, however much mass there is, I think the degrees of improvement would be the same, but maybe someone's going from, okay, you know, this much to this much, or from that much to that much, you know, and in the scheme of things, we haven't even really been doing that that long. So she sees me do these ones where I lay back with crazy range of motion, like yeah. reverse Nordic style to levels that my doctor mm -hmm. said, my knee would never bend that far, but I'm strong in that range, which when you actually load and get strong. So my range of motion is not from stretching it. It's from strengthening it gradually through range of motion, which then causes the tissue to lengthen, which research shows four times less chance mm -hmm. of injury compared to strengthening or stretching right. alone, which are both fine. But I'm just saying, if you want miracles around the knee, man, even science is indicating loading through a full range of motion for the area you know, again, to whatever you can do without pain, it's, it's like a little investment. So next week it's like, Oh my God, that's a little bit. Easy. And then the next, it's not like an instant thing. And she's seen now it's crazy say, easy for me, crazy, easy. even, even compared to six months ago for me. Yep, yep, yep. So we don't know where that could stop. So maybe but, if someone started even tighter than me, mm -hmm. maybe six, eight years later, maybe it would have, maybe they would have the range of motion of someone who never had surgery. Correct me if I'm wrong, but still again, <laughs> back to the point, if you can walk, then you can walk backwards. So if you can, if you physically can stand yeah. on your two legs and your knees haven't been altered, mm -hmm. so that you literally can't I've, stand. I've even had Hold people send walking oh, backwards in, in the, the pool. water. In the <laughs> water. That's what I was gonna say. Like, so because of the gravity, oh, good. It helps doing the exercises in a pool after surgery. That's what we've had as success stories. And then it's you know helped them a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and you just add on the money in the bank. Basically, that theory. You just a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. So. And, yeah. and there's certain things, it's a little bit off topic, but there's certain things that it's kind of like someone has to talk about it. I had a thing that started when I was like nine is the first time it happened. And my knee went out of place. Mm -hmm. And it's the strangest thing. And your knee pops out 
and you can't straighten your leg. You can't walk. You can't, and you have to pop your knee back into place. And this turns out this affects, we don't know how many, but I know thousands of people. There's a forum and it's actually not really your knee popping out of place. It's where the tibia and fibia, so a lower leg bone and an upper leg bone meet and it pops out of place and it's called tibiofibular dislocation. No one talked about this my whole life. Oh. I had it so bad. No doctor knew what it was. I found a chat online of a bunch of people like me who had it. And sadly, tons of them had surgeries for like their meniscus, totally misdiagnosed surgery only to find that they still that the it. condition kept happening. Cause it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a tournament. It was because it was because of this dislocation. A third of athletes checked have conditions that they could have surgery on if they were to go get checked. So it's a really, it's right. Right. It gets into freaky territory. Like don't get, if you go get checked, there's a chance you could be asymptomatic and you could be advised to surgery completely asymptomatic. So about a third of people have right. asymptomatic issues that they could have a surgery on. And again, with something like this mm -hmm. tibiofibular dislocation, there were people in this chat, 70 plus years old who had been their whole lives given multiple surgeries having people think they're crazy yeah. that this is occurring. People didn't even believe what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I swear my knee is popping out. You know what I mean? And I can't straighten my leg. Right, and right. and so if that 70 year old went on that chat, how many people have lived and died not once ever being told what their condition actually was, you know? And really all you have to do, right. how is big is this forum? It was, it was in the thousands. But it's and, also and not most even of us, right, so there's, there could be millions like, that don't know. There right, could be. Exactly. Right. And it's very hard to find. And for most of us, we're going, someone else has this because it's not something you like talk about a lot. It's very <laughs> embarrassing. Totally. It's super embarrassing. And usually you try to pop your knee back into place before anyone notices. Sometimes you can't get it to pop into place. Anyways, I wrote up again, I wrote up an article on that. Tibial fibular but dislocation. So many people on the forum also said, like, I will tell my mom and they won't, be, you know, she won't believe me. You know, it was this weird thing that people couldn't understand if they didn't have it happen to themselves. Yeah. And that happened to me first when I was nine years old. And now only at like 29 years old, I find like a forum of other people. And for me, it went from happening all the time to just gradually stopping happening from. I guess just getting these different ranges of motion and strength around the area, but tons of people since I wrote the article now have been like, Oh my God, like that thing ruined my life. I was given a surgery and then this, and then this, and that's what it is. And you're the first person to describe what it is. So some of these things are just like, look, I, I might not be everything, everyone, I might not be the most politically correct, but like someone's got to talk about some of these things, you know, someone's got to talk the tibialis right. fell out of style of training. And if someone goes <clears throat> onto my YouTube, that was yesterday's video. And I even credited it and explained how it used to be common about 50 years ago. And the tibialis training was common mm -hmm. right before steroids entered bodybuilding. Cause the guy popularizing the tibialis, he was Mr. Universe, but his passion was getting kids off mm -hmm. drugs, off the streets. And so then when steroids entered, which was against everything that he had gotten into fitness for back in the sixties, you got mm -hmm. into bodybuilding to be as fit and as healthy as you could be. And then it, as steroids right. entered the scene and as the different money and sponsorships entered the scene, it turned into more of a, of a competition and bodybuilding just became more of an appearance route versus a function route, which I would still argue to this day mm -hmm. that training for function will give the best appearance. And that really steroids has clouded the scene and steroids has, confuse people into training for aesthetics when really you're seeing all the bodybuilder. I mean, they have to have two different divisions, you know, and the, the guys taking the most steroids make the most money. Right. Like what, like I'm not even judging them. Do you want to be successful in your career? Mm -hmm. You have to shoot a lot of jump shots. Okay. You want to be successful. You have to take steroids. I mean, I'm not judging them. You know, I would, as a basketball player, mm -hmm. I never had to be in that position, but the simple fact remains that tibialis training was common, you know, in the sixties, by the number one bodybuilder right before steroids entered the scene. And he quit, he stopped competing. Right, well, that actually, um, that leads into a lot of, cause you mentioned a couple of different things. And I wrote down some notes. Some things that 
I've noticed that a lot of bodybuilders will do, and they'll, they'll sometimes they'll talk about it in their videos, or if I talk, talk to them in person, they notice they can grow their muscles better. Um, this is a, some of them, not all of them, uh, but they tell me this. They they don't want to do a full range of motion because they feel like they can get a better pump with a half range of motion and not really working their elbow or their their knee or their ankle through the full range of motion. And they might have eventually they develop some pain because of this, and then they have to avoid that range of motion. Okay, they can do 100 pounds through the top, not through the middle, not through the bottom. So like, well, you know, I want to do 100 pounds, so I'm just going to do just the top. Part of that is ego. Part of that is just them avoiding pain eventually. How would you? I can answer it very clearly for them in two words. uh, What? Okay, go ahead. Tom Platts, the greatest legs in bodybuilding history in the steroid era, still the greatest Mm -hmm. legs. Tom Platts had a beautiful full range of motion squat. He could do the splits. He has the best legs ever. If you want a long-term grow an area, your flexibility actually limits how much you can access that area. So he never won because his legs were too muscular. Okay. Like his problem was that his legs were too good. So success leaves clues. <laughs> best bodybuilding legs in history had the best range of motion in history. Yeah. So it's that simple. It's short-term right. versus long-term thing. Of course, short-term, it might seem easier. Mm-hmm. To have, and it is. Short-term, almost anything is going to seem easier in life. Look at the greatest, most successful right. companies. It wasn't a six-week pump program. <laughs> you know, Facebook wasn't a six-week, no. you know. It, so it's just short-term thing versus long-term thing. If you want to be successful, I follow stats. Right. I, don't, I don't give a shit about opinions. My, if I say anything, it's an opinion. Right. You don't have to believe it. I only care. And that's why I'm obsessive. Yeah. How many different historical cases have I mentioned in this? that almost no one ever talks about. You know what I mean? That's where I get my data from. Yeah. I get it from real life and from, from actual facts, not from opinion. So even if I accidentally say an opinion or something, e- even I would yeah. you know, go off that. And, and the statistically, yeah, the most successful people have a long-term approach. You know, That's just statistics. So Right. So strength through range of motion makes everything better, in your opinion. Strength through range of motion. Statistically, you have better long-term chances of anything you want. Muscular development, even. All right, another one. Uh, all right, all right. Be- best high jumper of all time in terms of how tall he was to how high mm-hmm. he jumped. He won a gold medal at five foot eleven. He was able to compete more often than ever than anyone in history. So he was more bulletproof statistically. He's in his forties now, still crazy athletic. Stefan Holm, guess what? Full squatter. Yet in high jump, most of them avoid full squats. They're like, oh my God, that's not a high jump, a full squat. Yet, so the, the best full bender was also the best high jumper in history. Long-term approach, you know? So right. in, in general, in general, limiting range of motion, you're just limiting ability. So there's just long-term, there's no good you know, data that, that less ability and weakness and stiffness is going to help us out. Statistically, Statistically, those are all just going to be bad for our bodies in the end and prevent our right. full potential. Absolutely. And, and and I think part of it is, like you mentioned, it's the misinformation that we think wouldn't still be there, but it's still so prevalent through like high school coaches or you know some high school coaches or things, things they re- read online or see online. Um, some people are still surprised when I tell them they can strengthen their joints because they think it's just their muscles. Okay. They, I'll say, yeah, you can strengthen your bones. They're like, why did I never think of this? Well, it always made sense to me because, you know, if, you're, if you can only lift 100 pounds and you train to lift 1,000 pounds and only your muscles get stronger, uh, your bones are going to have issues, your joints are going to have issues. So, yeah, I mean, Wolf's Law, you know, shows that we can increase our bones strength, you know, to increasing force, similar to how we strengthen our muscles. Davis's Law is the corollary law to how we can strengthen our joints. So right. something I want to touch upon, and that's very related to that, is the dis- the distinction between flexibility and mobility which you touched upon a little bit earlier it's not just the range of motion that you can access because there are some contortionists um, who really really stretch the range of motion beyond what some people would say is natural and they do have joint problems but because they relax into that they don't have strength through that range of motion they have those joint problems so how do you how do you distinguish between flexibility and mobility 
I mean, I don't get caught up in the in the names of them. I know what you mean that people will have different mm -hmm. names and yeah, opinions yeah. on flexibility versus mobility. Whatever someone wants to call it is good. I just call it strength through length because any one of these factors, you can see my whole theory is that knees over toes, you want to be strong. Knees behind toes, you want to be strong. Either of them out of balance to each mm -hmm. other would prevent the full capacity. Ankles, knees, hips in balance. Mm -hmm. Ankle flexion, extension, knee flexion, extension, ankle, uh, hip flexion, extension, and balance from one side of the body to the other. Even within that, we train the strength curve, meaning imagine something like a Nordic. At the start of it, there's no tension yet when your knee is bent. That's the easy part. And then the more mm -hmm. you straighten your leg, the harder it gets, right? But when I stand there right. and I pull the dumbbell with my hamstring, it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And when my leg is straight, there's no tension yet. And when it bends, that's where the most tension is. So we even train each of these qualities. So the whole thing is built on, on yin yang. So mobility, flexibility, whatever people want to call it, the range of motion there, mm -hmm. it's got to be in balance to the strength. Either one of them out of balance to each other. Absolutely. It leaves you vulnerable. So if you, if you're weak right there and you're only strong here, or if you're, you know, any of these things out of balance, it's like, it's almost too simple that I'm having to like explain it, but really I shouldn't even, you know, we should like start podcast, right? Right. Start podcast, be strong everywhere. Meaning not just meaning the whole range of motion <laughs> balance through your body and podcast. I mean, literally. Right. Just right. Be strong through your body's God given ranges of motion top to bottom. Oh yeah. I mean, like when you really think about it, that I'm sure this is something you think about because I thought about it the other day is if you really think about like how simple your actual message is and your philosophy is, you think, well, there's not that much stuff I can say. It's like, yeah, start with something you can do and work your way up. You know, your, your body will acclimate. The rest is just details. I mean, I wish there was more because I can make more videos about it, but that's just, um, it's, it's pretty simple. And the rest is just how you apply that. So yeah, I, I totally get that. Totally understand. Yeah. Our, our um, whole philosophy on like when we make videos each day and stuff is really, we're just trying mm -hmm. to really, ju we're just trying to update whatever we feel like needs the most, you know, updating in our system. Meaning like maybe there's a new piece of equipment mm -hmm. out to help, or maybe there's a new alternative to the equipment that can help. You know what I mean? Cause I'm obsessive in the videos about showing body weight version, equipment version, no equipment version. So all the areas I've talked about, someone can start training with no weights and no equipment. So all right. we're really doing is all we're really doing is updating how quickly we can get across the teaching and help people use it. But you know, and as it gets as simpler. It, as it, it simple doesn't get more complex. Be. Yeah. It gets even simpler as we go. Absolutely. This is kind of I was trying to find a way to work it in. I feel like it's an important piece that we mentioned but we didn't really go in depth is you mentioned you don't have to work through your area. You don't have to work through the pain, you know, like e even working through slight pain, you can start with something you can do pain free and enjoy it and work your way up and get better without pain. What about sound? Because I, I only, I'm only oh, really yeah. like, I, I mentioned this like two oh, or three yeah. times because people, I know people will ask, um, yeah. what if you don't have pain, but you have sound? What is your experience with that? I, and I have a free article and a free video titled knee noise. Okay. So trust me, I'm all about this topic. <laughs> My knees used to be so loud that I would be scared to work out through these exercises if anyone else was in the gym. This is when I was just testing it out, right? Mm -hmm. And what I found is that when, wow. you scale, when you scale to your pain-free area, it's much less noisy. And you can almost use this as a gauge over time of what can you do with minimal noise. However, noise does not equal bad knees. Meaning theoretically, let's say someone started out with a ton of noise they could build to the most protected knees in the world. You could be able to land from a skyscraper theoretically, and you could still have some noise when you do deep bends. Do you see what I'm saying? So you could have the most bulletproof yeah. knees in the world. You could still have some noise. When it's excessive, like more than, you know, when it's really loud, usually that indicates room for improvement. So I would often on these ATG split squats, I use that as the barometer for noise because you get to compare one knee to the other knee. And when I would coach athletes, I would go down and I would listen to their knee and I would make sure they know that it's okay. And I would compliment them. Wow. That was less noise than, you know, 
that was less noise than last week or whatever. So it's just an right. indicator. It's just an indicator. Um, the body can have noise. So someone shouldn't let that worry them. There's a distinct quality when the noise is accompanied by discomfort. And a lot of us, there's training, honestly, okay. with your body. You know, it's one thing to say you don't have pain. It's another thing to actually work at that level. So for a lot of people, it's kind of, it's kind of a process of getting to where they learn to actually find that zone they can do without pain. Not to mention when we do these bending, when we do the things that cause the noise, this is usually like the fifth exercise in the session. So some people be like, like, mm -hmm. Oh, I tried that. Or I tried. Trust me, the magic is in the details of how you gradually build your body to these qualities. So you have blood in the right tissues. You're getting pumps in the right areas before you even go into these things. So you can get into this stuff a lot less noisily than you might think. And then you can use that as a barometer over time of, you know, did your noise get less, but I've seen plenty of bulletproof knees that, you know, have noise and over time of improving on some of these things, they got less noise. It doesn't mean that if you have noise that you have a bad knee. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's been my experience as well. Then that makes a lot of sense. One thing before we start getting into, um, like you can start licking people, you can tell people beginners where to start. Cause I'm sure some people listening to this are hyped up. <laughs> They're in the middle of it. They want to start something that I think every fitness channel person will get at some point is someone will tell them, I want to do what you do. I want to be able to get better, but I lack motivation. What has been your experience with that, with people who, who tell you that, you know, that there's different stories, but they often say something like, I want to get better. I want to do what you do, but I just can't motivate. My, I can't, you know, I'm not making fun of them, but they say, well, I don't want to do the five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes a day. Um, has there been anything that's worked for you? And I only ask this because I'm experimenting. Not like some, some things will work for, for some people, not so well for other people. So what has been your experience in motivating others? I think, I think the shit has to work. Like if you're not seeing results, I feel like that's what kills the motivation, to be honest, you know? And then there is the I energy see. factor. Good answer. There is the mm -hmm. energy factor though. So when I really polished this system, I was in college playing basketball because I had done enough of it to get healthy. But where I was really tested was now uh, having to be on a team. I became, you know, I was playing more minutes than anyone on a team. I still wasn't very athletic yet. You know, I just started this stuff. And so mm -hmm. doing a college workload, college classes, college practices, all this stuff, and then still trying to get my mm -hmm. session in, I gravitated towards this 30 minute a day style. And you see now I like kind of the 30 minute right. a day style, yep. but I do have one program that's designed for off season pro athletes. It's not 30 minute sessions. Most people won't have the motivation, even for me as a dad and a business person, even for me, most of the year, mm -hmm. I won't have motivation. So I live the system. I do the 30 minute. We have three programs of 30 minute sessions. And then we have a fourth program of like an hour session. So like there's my year of training and I just live that. So part of it, part of it is, you know, giving a, a good estimation of how much energy it's going to take, because if it's going to take too long, I don't blame them. You know what I mean? It's, it might not be the first priority on your list. You know what I mean? So that's part of it. Um, but like I said, it, it does have to work and you have to like what you're doing. So that's, but let me add, I want to see if I can help on your question. It seems like what he's asking is like that person that is laying in bed, that's listening to the podcast that wants to go do it and is just not going to get up because they have no motivation to just go get started. Is that more of what you're saying? Like, how do I start? Uh, or make myself start. Well, it, ha it has to work. That's um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Th that was part of it. But yeah, Ben did, did answer part of it because I think what was implied in his answer was that the reason some people don't feel motivated is because they don't think it's working for them. It's working so slow that they think they do this and then it hurts and then it's taking so long. And they're like, well, I just don't have the time to put in two hours a day yeah. uh, when it's really like five, 10, 30 dedicated good minutes. But if you have something to say to those people who, are feeling I, that way. I, I'm sure that resonated with some people. Yeah. What would you say? No, I do. And, and I would say that I kind of think about it different. So let's say you have quote unquote lazy person. In my opinion, mm -hmm. they're probably not lazy. They've tried, they probably just been led wrong. That so makes sense. the laziest I felt was after these years of coaches 
pushing me on methods that didn't work for me. That you know totally what I mean? Makes sense. And I became a lazy couch mm -hmm. potato watching TV shows for hours at night. That's you see what I mean? So, so true. people look at me as a pillar of motivation. So look at me oh laying God, face down that. on my futon, <laughs> you know, watching he would how I met your he mother. Would, he would call like, it decompression time. I call it decompressing. I, I watch the entire series. <laughs> Seinfeld, they call it decomposing, you know, the summer of George. So the summer of Ben, right. <laughs> anyone, uh, if anyone knows Seinfeld, uh, basically, yeah, I watched every episode of Seinfeld probably a few times too many, you know, so <laughs> every my, right, right. my every point day. is that I can relate to what it's like being lazy, but I feel like it's because you have a leader who's leading you to die in battle and you really don't want to get up and go, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I look at it different. I think we're all a lot more powerful than we're given credit for. I don't think that because one person Absolutely. is a TV star that they magically have something successful about them that you don't have. You know what I mean? I, I, I think we all have the exact same thing within us. And, you know, can I you, add one thing too? when no. you're done? Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, one thing too, that I realized is it's also like your support system and how you big, how, like how you were brought big. up your coaches, you your probably teammates, have the wrong your, people around your, you. Yeah. Your parents, your friends, your teachers who supported you and believed in you that you could accomplish whatever you were trying to do. My most successful grand friend growing up played seven years in the NFL. His mom believed he was going to the NFL and would make him as a kid talk as if he was going to the NFL. Now, no one believed I was going to the NBA. I didn't make the NBA, but <laughs> for him, his mom really believed he was going to the NFL. In my case, my parents, here I am, surgeries. I was painting walls every day to make money. You know, I was okay. going nowhere. Cool. No okay. one would have thought, oh, yeah, you're going to get a college basketball scholarship like years. Ago. But my parents literally let me keep going for it. They never put it into my head mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to get a college basketball scholarship. Yep. I don't think any of us believed I was going to make the NBA. Maybe we should have, you know. <laughs> um, and I'm actually, to give you an idea of how crazy this works out, for a couple of years now, I've had the idea that I am going to make the NBA. The NBA has this little thing about it that you can be a much older player. And if the team thinks you mm -hmm. can like really help them out mentally or some way, you could. There was like a 38-year-old rookie one year. So I'm turning 30 in June. Huh. I think when I'm 38, I think I'm going to be playing in the NBA. I genuinely believe that I'm going to be in the NBA when I'm 38. Okay. And the people around me are as crazy as I am. I that they're I like. They believe it because yeah. on average, one in five players is injured and can't even suit up for the game. So if I can even improve that a little mm -hmm. bit, I'm worth more than my one fifteenth of the roster. Just give me a, I'll just make the team healthier. Leave it up to me to earn my minutes on the court. You know, I'll make the team healthy. But right. the point is that the point is that the people around me literally believe I'm going to be in the NBA when I'm 38. So it really matters who's around you. So if you're not motivated, you probably are being led into something where your investment of your time and energy is not really giving you the return that you want. You know what I mean? So I've been lazy as hell like right. that when I knew I'm going to do this workout, which is just going to tear me down even more. You see what I mean? And I've been lazy as shit mm -hmm. and not yeah. wanted to go. And, you know, God, I hope there's a, you know, a thunderstorm and practice gets canceled. You know what I mean? Like I've been that mode. Yeah. So I think, I think you actually brought up the best topic of the whole podcast, which is that I think we're all extremely powerful. I agree. And I think we can typecast ourselves as lazy or this or that. Uh -huh. But we got to have the right, we got to be following a path where our month, you know, the, the effort we put in has to be leading toward our goals. Some return. Yeah. It's got to be leading. It's got to be right. You know, and then we do have to have people around us. It doesn't mean they have to be delusional, but you know, I don't know. What's the purpose of life if you don't go for your goals? You know, my parents, right? a logical parent, quote unquote, would have said, dude, you got to get, a, you know, you got to give up this basketball thing. You know, like you're like three years out of high school. Like you weren't even recruited in high school. Like you can't touch the rim. Like you're right. not going to, you know. <laughs> but they believed me. Alyssa believed in me. You yeah. know, I put all my savings into trying to go to this like second chance team to like get recruited where on day one, they told me, their expert told me, you can't get a scholarship. He told me that day one, like I'm paying you like 15 <laughs> grand as like a second chance to get recruited. Day one, you can't get mm -hmm. a scholarship. But my dad still believed in me. 
She still believed in me. Good. My mom Good. still no. believed in me. And I got That's... a full I got a full scholarship. But maybe I would have believed that guy if I didn't have nice. someone else in my corner. So I completely proved him wrong. He called me the day that I signed my full scholarship. He said, don't take it. I know that coach. He's never going to put you in the game. <laughs> no joke. I ended up starting every game <laughs> for two years, led them to a conference title. Great. Florida Scholar Athlete of the Year. But you get my point is that but I was lucky to have some people who believed in me. There's so many people telling us, you know, what we can't be or. I think that goes for everything too, because yeah. so I used to ice skate for 10 years competitively. You probably don't know that, but anyway, we used awesome. to go to, we used to be in elementary school together and he was the only male. Oh, we're the only, we're the only like super dedicated athletes, you know? So I was ice skating yeah, yeah. Was, uh, basketball and we both would leave early every day for school to go to practice and put our hours in every day, no fail, you know, miss all kinds of trips. I missed, um, you know, the, we had whitewater rafting every summer. I never went on it. Never, ever, ever, because I was so focused yeah. on what I wanted to do, which was ice skating. But I remember my mom used to always tell me Tara Lipinski had her, Tara Lipinski was the youngest uh, gold, gold medalist. medalist in the Olympics. And her, up until recent, someone's done it since, but in my time, she was the youngest. Her dad made her a podium and she would stand up and pretend like she won a gold medal at the Olympics. She obviously mm -hmm. believed growing up that she was really going to win, yep. you know, an Olympic gold medal. And, and me right. and her, okay, we found a passion at a young age. People can find this at different ages. Yep. Look how many of the most successful people right. didn't get successful yep. until much later in life. Yep. So what does that mean? Did they have a successful right. gene? Because if you interviewed them in their 20s, they would have been, they were failing. What about this unsuccessful piece of shit? And now they're giving speeches on how to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, Never too late to hit your stride. You know, interview with the guy with knee pain and say, what's wrong with you that you just have the worst knees? You know, what, what are you doing? You know, wrong. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, and now interview. What would you have me. said? I don't know. I'm trying, man. <laughs> like, I'm trying. I'm doing <laughs> yeah. You know, I had to get the right. That would be mentor. inspirational in itself. Yeah. Charles exactly. Poliquin was the guy who popularized this idea. The stronger you are with your knees over your toes, the more protected you are. That led me to Keegan Smith who goes by at the ATG mentor, because he's been my primary mentor through this journey as knees over toes guy. So he's brought out the best in me. This is a mentor from Australia who I didn't meet in person for like mm -hmm. years that he was changing my life. Kadur mm -hmm. Ziani, one of the most positive minds I've ever met. If you want to see flexibility, it'll blow your mind. Kadur Ziani, mm -hmm. check this out. He's 47 years old, All right, five up. foot 11, and can dunk on a 10 foot hoop. He's the oldest person under six foot who can dunk on a 10 foot hoop. And he he's one of the few people in history who can jump up and kick the rim with his foot. That's now one of my goals. Guess who okay. believes in me? Kadur believes in me. He's one of, he's my jump mentor now. Right, right. He's the most positive right, right. person. You've got to look up Kadur Ziani if you're a body weight person. <clears throat> he trained almost exclusively with body weight, is one of the highest jumpers in history. Call it for our podcast people. Yeah, it's tough. K-A-D-O-U-R is the first name. And the last name is Z-I-A-N-I. -I. Kadur Ziani, Frenchman, one of the highest jumpers okay, cool. in the history of the world. One of the best deep knee benders ever. One of the most flexible athletes. And he's 47 and can still dunk on a 10-foot hoop at 5'11". So you can see the people I've been learning from. I'm learning from these outlier, mm -hmm. you know, cases in terms of results, not opinions, just results. So of course I wasn't scared to get flexible right, right. when a guy who had a 50 inch vertical in his prime, who's dunking at 40. So if I'm in my twenties, can't dunk, this guy's 47 shorter than me and can dunk. I'm not going to tell him, mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, I shouldn't be too flexible. You know what I mean? Or whatever. Cause I get these young right, athletes right. and they're like, I'm worried. I'll lose my jumping. If I get too flexible. Well, greatest jumper in history of the world is extremely flexible. So I doubt you have anything to worry about. You know what I mean? Right. Anyway. Yeah. So, Don't have any, no. so I've had, so, I've had these tremendous, I've had these well, tremendous mentors. That's the point. You got to get the right people, whether it's online or whatever, you got to get, you know, the mm -hmm. right people who are seeing their goals come true, mm -hmm. who therefore have, you know, they've walked a route that you want to walk. So you look, I just named like a few different mentors. It doesn't mean you have to have one mentor. You know what I mean? I love, um, right. I like, I like Gary V. I don't follow him as much anymore, but 
he helped me. Uh, no, I, I didn't know him personally. I didn't know him personally. Everyone else I'm super mm-hmm. close with personally. Um, okay. Gary V is kind of like when you start going on social media, even if you get 99 people thanking you, that one hater, you know what I mean, who just says the weirdest, mm-hmm. most nasty comment, uh, it can get to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so I, I feel like Gary V helped me like not fall into that trap. You know what I mean? And stay positive. And honestly, yeah. now, honestly, Alyssa and I now, we follow you. Like you're a mentor yeah. for me. You're oh, one of the, yeah, I follow you too. <laughs> so likewise, yeah, but <laughs> you're a key mentor for me because you're so positive, just so you know, and your beliefs that, you know, what we believe everyone can do the ATG system and that you say, you know, you can, and my it's friend. so much it's deeper than so that. Cool. Like, and how you, you help without fun. trying to get anything in return. That's exactly right. Huge, huge. So that's the, like, we're there studying, like we're last night, we're like studying How you and like, so having the right people, yep. I think is absolutely huge. I've learned from absolutely. you already. And I, <laughs> well, I'm glad. Thank you for all the kind words you said. And I, I absolutely have started exploring your content. And before I do a podcast with someone, I, I if they have a video or something, I always listen to them um, before I come here. I just want to get a feel for it. I get into the zone for it. I was listening to your um I think it was the ATG mobility standards checklist or something. I think it was your most viewed one on YouTube. And I got, yeah. a, like, I got a feel for how you spoke, how it did. So I'm definitely yeah. going to watch more of your stuff and great. If you haven't seen the video, go check it out. What is the title? So you can give our viewers. It's the seven ATG mobility standards checklist, which I've since polished even better, but it has so many views. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I took it down for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm obsessive about trying to put out the most accurate data. And I'm like, oh, but it's, yeah, yeah. But, it, but it is so many people are writing in that it helped them. So I'm like, all right, the greater good is to leave it up there. Well, no, that's, that, that is something that I have noticed. And any, just about anyone who's done content uh, for a while, they've noticed this, especially I like video. I love video. It's one of my um, one of my favorite ways to communicate. I type a lot. I talk a lot, as you've seen. Um, but I, I like video because I like connecting with someone face to not face to face, but I like looking at the camera and just talking and speaking my truth um but one of the, the downfalls is that you can't add to it okay a video i made back when i was taking care of my mom and i had 20 minutes of stuff 20 minutes to do to do a video including editing every day um what is me talking about cold showers and it's three minutes i'm like it's so bad <laughs> like the, 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 the uh the content is still good but i'm like i would just rephrase so much stuff you know i would be much more articulate but back then i had one take or i wasn't gonna do anything so i did that and that's getting almost a million views now and i'm just like and i left a little blurb in the comments it's like yes this was done before anybody was really watching my content <laughs> i can make a new one so i just wouldn't worry about it if you want you can link what what i'm trying to do is i want to start a better blog and in the comments or in the description i'll say here's an updated version on what I think of this, you know, and then you can add on. Yeah. Yeah. You can add on to that. Yeah. It's, it's a good, it's a tough call. And, you know, as long as you keep at it, then I think some people will even follow and they'll follow along and they'll go, Oh, wow. I like how you improved there. Yeah. You know? So. Right. That's part of the, that's part of the, of the the trick of it. We, we nailed our last scene for today's video at 1159, one minute before I was supposed to hop on here because it was like, super because it was super hot. So like the phone was overheating and you know, the, the, we only have a certain amount of time because the baby, like we're just waiting. He may wake up at any time, you know? So my point is that I know how that feels. Yeah. I think a good thing to, to follow, uh, to finish up on because how our baby is still asleep right now is amazing. He's having a nap from the gods. I'm jealous of the nap this guy is getting right now. But right. I think it would be cool to finish up and talk about, about like you said, a lot of, and I think a lot of my followers as well, want to know how to succeed and grow on so on different social media platforms and stuff. I think it'd be Completely a great agree. way. I was just about up. to bring that up. I think it'd be a great way to finish up. Right. Um, can by I just, talking about that. Yeah. Can I just add one thing and then you guys can take from there? Sure. I just want to basically say how incredible Ben is with being a parent because he has been basically equal to me not just like you're the mom do everything kind of thing like as you can see he's said the baby wakes up like we basically take care of this baby together and of course he goes between me Mm -hmm. and Ben and me and Ben but Ben has been such a support system and honestly I feel like a pretty damn 
amazing role model father for just any father that wants to be amazing because you know uh it's not just been i I do put my family first yeah Alyssa's way off the mark saying that i'm 50 percent, not even remotely close she's (laughs) on she's an unbelievable mother and i'm just like a doofus doing my best but (laughs) For any, yeah, for any dads out there or people who are going to be dads, you said you have a fiance, which is awesome. We haven't gotten to, you know, right. chat much before this, but I do think it'll work out still for your business if you put your family first. I feel like there's something about that nature oh, that I do that, that now. The stronger your family, do now. your business is going to be more stable. So I used to be a workaholic right. and since having the kid and getting married, I've tried putting family first and now. Now she's come in and she's the CEO of my business. So like a few years back, we didn't have like an online business. Like it was just a gym, you know, when, when it comes to an online business, there's right, not a right. lot more, there's a lot more businessy things to do there. You know what I mean? And, and so now she's a, a, mm. a beast on it. And so we are, we have this perfect teamwork now with me and her running our business. Um, so she's doing an amazing job with it. And the point is just that like, I think things will work out if I wasn't here maybe we wouldn't have spent all this time kind of working together. You know what I mean? So whatever it is for you, I think that, I think that putting your family first somehow, some way will actually pay off for your business and your happiness more. And as he said, that was absolutely, that wasn't always the case. Oh, I shoot, I shoot videos from my yard every day. Now I don't have distractions of going to a gym. I never thought I'd be shooting videos in my yard. I owned a gym for six years prior to Corona. I would have shuddered at the idea of right. shooting videos in my yard, you know, and now it's been the best mm-hmm. thing for our business because it allows me to have all my focus on helping everyone out there online instead of being distracted in person, having fun, playing hoops. So it's, it's that time of my life. I'm being a dad and running the online business. But my point is like, this was a blessing in disguise. You know what I mean? Of having to like, I wanted yeah. to put myself here with my kids, spend all this time. I put them on my chest and I walk him every afternoon. I can't wait. When we're done, when he wakes up, yeah. I get to go take him for a walk. And But somehow, mm-hmm. this shit pays off. I think going for those walks uh, gives me time to really you know, get out of the gym of what everyone else is doing and really think about the product. So the amount of progress- oh, Absolutely, I- what, what, 100%. Yeah, going for a walk. When people ask me what my favorite exercise is, I often say taking a walk. Okay, and it's not just for the physical benefits, but because I get to realign my life. I'm like- I want to do this. I like, this is all my best ideas. Like yep. even partially hybrid calisthenics <laughs> I got from going on a walk and just thinking. Same with us yep. because we got a dog. So we had to take him for a walk, which I hated walking <laughs> and is the best thing that happened for us. We came up with, with the idea really of like doing online business. And it was a friend who gave me the idea, but still the point is we were like, we we're walking every day yep. and like, yeah, I, anyways, be a, a dad or a okay. mom first. And I think it'll somehow work out even better for you. A hundred percent. Well, I mean, just, just to mention before we dive a little bit more into it and then we'll finish up, I don't get burnt out. And people ask me, it's like, well, you, you do a lot of stuff. Don't you feel tired? I'm like, no, yeah. no. Like the, the, the stuff energizes me because like, if I feel like it's not really working today and I, I, I know I have the luxury of this. Some people need to do more hours, especially if you're starting out. I know I have the luxury of this, but this is something I prioritized as soon as I had the ability is I will go spend five hours um, with my fiance in a, a day or I'll, sp- I'll spend longer with her. You know, I'll, I'll take out uh, weekends if I want to, or I'll spend time with family um, just because I, I don't want to be the person who makes a lot of money. And it's just like, well, you know, I don't know my kids. I don't know my family. I, I don't I don't know anybody. Um, and I'm not going to like, everyone's like, well, I'll get to that point after I make a million dollars. Yeah. No, you're not. After, after you make a million dollars, you'll have so many more responsibilities. You'll want to make 2 million, 5 million. Yeah. You'll owe people $10 million and be like, babe, I want to go rafting with the kids, but you know, I, I gotta, I gotta do this, this speech. I gotta do this. Mm-hmm. No. So like I make, I enjoy the process for the record, because I want to say this. I believe I support you. I believe you can be in the NBA if you because look at the process. You enjoy the process of that. Look, I mean, it's not like oh, I'm going to sacrifice everything. You know, I'm not going to have a family. I'm not going to help anybody. I'm going to focus on myself so I can be in the NBA. If you said that, I'd be like, I just want to say anything. I, just, I, I, I would try to. What do I tell you? Some, some days I'm like. 
babe, I don't think I really want to do that. I love my lifestyle that I get to be with Onyx every day. I know. So <laughs> it, it would be say the same thing. Number one, it would be for like a season just to say that I did it. Number two, right, right. Number two, it keeps me motivated as a coach that I'm going to get faster and jump higher and get more bulletproof. Yeah. And so it, it, right. it pushes me to be better. Exactly. Before Corona, I was playing against my NBA players one on one, putting that pressure on myself, the, my NBA clients. So right. it, it's more about the pressure it puts on me. But, and I will say to your point, what you were saying, I don't get burnt out either. I tried taking a, a weekend off and I was getting like depressed out of my mind. I can't, he can't. I can't take a day off. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't take a day off. I'm we tried. I was we worked on, I worked on Christmas, New Year's, but the point is I get this, this Same. balance where I go walk with my kid every day. And I do these things that I don't walk with my kid because I have a bunch of time on my hands. I walk with my kid because I turn down massive opportunities that could be appearing to be more fruitful to get to walk with my kid. Mm -hmm. I turn down every walk with my kid is an opportunity that I turn down to go train some celebrity or famous person. I've turned down so many it's famous so people so that I can go walk with my kid. You see what I mean? But I swear Absolutely. that somehow it makes me more successful because when I'm walking with him, the creative ideas are flowing. So I still think it'll work out for someone. But like you said, and, and it's it's like, what's the difference between a million and two million? Like, like you said, the person will put the next thing, the next thing. So we've already set it up. Like, how many times have I left you guys this year? Two. Three. Three. Okay. Two of them. I'm not going to say their name. <laughs> two of the richest athletes in the world. Oh, those two. And then the that one you'll podcast, never see me yeah. post on social media, even though it would be a quick money right. grab to show me training some of the most. Right. I've trained some of the richest athletes in the world. They happen to live like 15, 20 minutes away and hit me up, you know, on Instagram or whatever. So one day, yeah, right. One day that I went to see each of them out of out of respect of their greatness, not for anything in it for me. Yeah. Nothing in it for me. No right. pictures. There's no evidence of it happening. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Just out to out right. of respect for them. And then I did go, an agreement I had made was to go do Mark Bell's podcast in Sacramento. So I left one night for that. But he was incredible. And then I, I was their fastest mom, person ever. Yeah. I was their fastest person ever. And I drove back. So I still saw my kid. So I've still seen him every day of his life. And I've only, I've only even left my workflow three days this year, you know? Yeah. Right. So well, yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. Let's look at the process, including that, you know, like whether or not they're just, they're celebrities because them being celebrities actually helps because they can tell more people about you and you can reach more people. So just look at the process, let's say of your goal of going to the NBA, like yeah. you are, it's not a process of like putting everyone down. You are raising yourself up towards your goal while raising everyone else up. You don't have to step on people. You bring them up and then, then they help you up. So that's absolutely a process. Um, before we start like going into the final part, cause I, I do want to get to certain things. How much time do you have left around like 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Cause it'll depend on how I frame this. You can take it. Even if the baby wakes up, I'll, I'll go to the baby. With you, I, feel oh, I, like I want to respect your family time too. With you, I feel like we would love to hang out, work out together, yeah. meet your fiance. Yeah. So we got it. We have, you know, many, we could spend probably days with you and not get bored in terms of today. I don't know. We'll do it a couple times. <laughs> we'll do it a couple times. Um, but since we're, we're on the topic, um, a lot of people are stuck at home uh, because of the pandemic and home business is trending probably more than ever. So, and one of the most popular growing small businesses is a YouTube channel, a YouTuber, so to speak. It doesn't just have to be YouTube. Now I want to emphasize that it doesn't just have to be YouTube. Um, but you are someone who's had, um, a great amount of success doing a home business. Um, you had a gym, but now you're doing stuff online. Um, what? What are some quick um, summary cliff notes you can give people who want to do the same thing? Some things you noted that helped you on this path to your success, as well as um, anything that you think that you might do differently. Well, I think it's a perfect way to kind of recap our whole conversation today, too, because when I <clears throat> am trying to do social media for social media, I get burnt out quick. I just feel weird. I'm not happy. So my whole, every decision I make comes down to one thing. What would the 12 year old me with knee pain 
what would he have wanted? So that would dictate, mm -hmm. you know, that is why I do a podcast once a week because it might reach that 12 year old kid out there. Or how am I, you know, mm -hmm. how am I putting across this post? And so I think it can be so easy to fall down that trap of if you're on YouTube trying to think what would be a catchy thing versus what's mm -hmm. the truest thing to my heart that I want to help someone else with the way you've put it without anything in return. And that's actually probably in my experience, that's going to really be your ticket is, and then you're not going to get burnt out because you're trying to help people. So trying to help yourself, you'll, I think you'll burn out. Cause I think people are, I think people are all, I think we're all naturally good. And so I feel like we don't burn out as much when the passion is to help others. And I feel like when it's about us, right? like I burn out, if it's about me, I'll burn out. If it's about others, I don't right. seem to burn out. And when, so it was like, I, you saw how passionate Same. I was about this Tibby Alice thing. And so I was so, mm -hmm. the video that came out yesterday and I couldn't wait to get up and shoot the video and this and that because of this 81 year old dude who lived his whole life trying to help other people. And I just wanted people to know about this guy, you know? So I, I credit him and put pictures right. of him in the video and like, that's what I was hyped up for. You know what I mean? I wasn't hyped up mm -hmm. to show someone that I can dunk a basketball. I was hyped up to tell people about this guy and share, you know, his wisdom that can help people. So it's like some of my mm -hmm. best YouTube videos, really all my best YouTube videos are just trying to help people. There's nothing about it. That's like trying to be catchy or like I had one thumbnail of my abs on a video and I already took that down and changed the thumbnail <laughs> and it's getting, it's getting more views without the abs thumbnail. So somehow yeah, it probably seems somehow, more genuine, huh? Somehow karma works out well, right? I put the abs thumbnail because someone was like, Hey, have you noticed you get a lot more views when your shirt is off or whatever? You know what I mean? So it's like, sometimes you, so yeah. sometimes I would, I got told the same thing. thing. Yeah. Sometimes I would base this just, Oh, maybe this will reach more, but it's got to just come down to like, you know, what would resonate with that 12 year old kid, you know? And so I'll often even say that in videos right. and stuff, because if there is a 12 year old kid out there, I want to just kind of connect with him. You know what I mean? Because when you're 12 and you already have knee right. pain, and you already told you have Osgood Schlatter's disease and, you know, all these different, I, I was told I had patellofemoral pain syndrome. And like when you're 12 and you have like diseases and syndromes in your knees. And you can't pronounce <laughs> that you can't say. Messes up, messes up your head, you know? So right. that's right. But like, that's been my social media strategy because a lot of people will say, you got to be consistent and you got to post every day. Well, I don't want to post every day if I'm burnt out. You know what I mean? I have to want to post mm -hmm. every day. I, so I feel like when right. you get to the root of it, you could probably make a, I could probably make a two hour course just on social media, but it would all come down to like, you got to find what you're passionate about really. You know what I mean? And then you can't let the, the weird stuff on YouTube and the thumbnails, cause I would see them about myself, you know? So now I don't even look. Whatever videos people are making, some of them were even good, but the thumbnail would be like knees over toes guy exposed. I'm like, what the frig are you exposing? <laughs> like, what is there to expose? Right. <laughs> and I click on it right. and then there's nothing about it. They just use the thumb, but I don't even. Right. The point. And in my mind, I'm thinking about making a video called like YouTube critics exposed. You know what I mean? Like, you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> right, right. Like, I'm going to expose. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to expose your, you know, your empty soul. Anyways, my point is that I didn't go down that route. I didn't, I don't make retaliation mm -hmm. videos. I don't talk or bash other people. I just try to put out what would not what you're here to do. Kid. Yeah. So you got to kind of find your motto, find your motto for yourself that then guides all the decisions. So for me, it's what would the 12 year old me with knee pain would have wanted. And, and that's my strategy that I don't get burnt out. Look at what I'm putting out. I'm not putting out like, what you should avoid to not blow out your knee. That might be a catchy title. Mm -hmm. The number one thing you shouldn't right. do. No, I don't do any of that. It's here's something that can help you the next day. Here's something that can help you the next day. Here's something that can help you. And it never burns out. And I just want to keep helping. And that has led to, I had 4,000 subscribers in December. That's when I started posting on YouTube. Prior to that, I only used it to house unlisted videos for for members. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can grow really fast. Just I've like for people four, that are wondering, the, yeah, the potential is still there to grow fast. Yeah. I've gone from four to two fifty, 
and I still haven't turned on the ad money. And I'm actually upset that YouTube puts ads. Did you know they reserve the right to put ads even if you don't? Yep. yep. Anyways. Fairly recent thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My point is just that I've had success there without having to play weird games by actually just sticking mm -hmm. to my fundamental purpose of what I'm trying to do, you know, to help other people. So to me, that's, to me, that's the trick of now and long-term success, you know, with social media that you're still going to be happy that you're not going to get burnt out because part, it's not just the success of it. Right. It's also how happy are you are with it. I can't, we can't wait to shoot every day Totally. to put out these things and like, right. If you could hear Ben, he's like a little kid. He's like, you know, he's like, I can't wait to do this. He's like, this is going to be the best video ever. And he's, you know, he's for my I'm hearing him right now. Meaning like, this is going to be like channel. our best. Yeah, man. our best shoot ever. And then the next day comes and he's like, oh, no, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Best shoot ever, you know, but and it's because it's not about trying to think how to be, you know, interesting about things. It's just trying to help the 12 year old me with knee pain. He, it just, he, it aligns everything. Yeah. Right. Just so trying to help. Um, and just, well, um, before that, I, I, I want to mention this because I, I, uh, I thought about this. Yeah. Well, you summarize a lot of my stuff. <laughs> Cause uh, like a lot of stuff that I would have said, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Just try to help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, uh, just try to help give to people. And, and I'm just gonna mention this really quick because I know that the me that was starting out would have wondered this because monetization, selling things is part of being able to do it full time and long term. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are so many paths you can go down. I mean, there's different YouTube videos you can watch. You can find ethical monetization without selling out. And also, if yeah. you have attention on something, you can make money. So don't worry too much about that if you're starting out. If you have it, if you can, if you can make a video and get like hundred thousand you know, 10,000, a lot of people to watch it. There is someone who's willing to pay for that attention and you can work with someone that you would like. So just to summarize everything about, about monetization, because I know it's a big question. If you have attention, you can get money. So don't worry too much about that. And you can get attention by helping people. Yeah. Something I, I heard I you say at the very beginning. Monetization, we deliver programs and coaching. So my strategy is <laughs> knowledge mm -hmm. is free. And then for programs and coaching, which takes time, that's paid. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And since we do okay on that, I don't also accept this opportunity and that opportunity and this opportunity that like, this is working. We're not greedy. Right. I turn people like you could make a killing on that equipment. Why? I'm already doing fine. And that guy already makes the equipment and does a phenomenal job. <laughs> I say the like, same why, thing. why do I have to be right. greedy for it? Like what, what is this? It's ingrained in our mind yeah. that, but if you actually look at like a really good civilization, like you would do your job well and your neighbor would do his job well and you would pay him well for his work and you wouldn't try to lowball him mm -hmm. because you can get it cheaper made in a different country. Like it gets really, so we kind of get this obsession right. with like, with like paying low, you know what I mean? And trying to grab all right. the money we can and then pay as little as we can when really we should do our best job that we do very well, let other people do their jobs really well mm -hmm. that they do. And we should pay people well for yeah. their work. You know what I mean? Right, right. Absolutely. That's something that people mention to me a lot too. It's like, well, you could do this, you could do this. And I'm like, well, I don't want to. And then their reasoning is always, well, think about how many more people you could help if you made that extra money. That's true, but that's a rabbit hole. And I'm just gonna be honest. It's a lie a lot of people tell themselves to make a lot of money and not care about people. It's money not really a lot of people makes after I make this million dollars. And it's not like those people that are making tons of money are then going to literally help all the other people with that money. You know, that money. The, the bigger change is not the goes, money that you yeah. give someone. It's, right. I think that's even kind of been proven that just giving someone money is not really the best thing you can do for them. Yeah. You helping know, the, them. Right. Actually, actually like Teach helping them. The fish. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Teach, exactly. Yeah. Teach them the exactly. fish. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So, you know, of course there's things you could, you can do with that. Uh, and you can make positive donations like like uh, the, like the amount of dogs put down is actually less than it was 10 years ago. So people's donations are actually working to improve that problem. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but like in terms of adopting dogs in the last 10 years, things have actually improved. Like the Humane Society, like they're actually succeeding in their goal. So, of course, there's things right. you can donate to. But I would say that really there's people donating their time to the humane society. Like that, that's a big deal, you know? And for most of us, mm -hmm. we're all going to have our own way of, you know, contributing. Mm -hmm. So just thinking right. that 
you can make money and then just like, you know, throw help at something, you know, you explained it. It's not as it's simple as that. You got to teach them to fish. Yeah, handle the underlying. Right, absolutely. You know. <clears throat> teach them to fish and people mistake the idea of making money as a trade-off to helping people when it's really one and the same. Okay, when the, the reason people are giving you money, ideally, is because you are bringing them value. And then they can go off and they can use that value to help others as well. So, no, you, you can definitely make money ethically in a way that where everyone is happy. In an ideal trade, everyone is happy. Yeah. So, so right. The, the, one thing, the one thing I heard you mention, because um, you said your phone was overheating. What do you film on? Do you film on your phone? Yeah. Yeah. iPhone. You don't even want to see. Yeah. Uh, yeah Recently listen to that listen to that guys because the amount of complaints <laughs> i had a lot of complaints on the <laughs> yeah exactly i got a mic so like the first hey, video people um, are like wow my left ear really thanks you for that and i'm like oh shit i have to change some settings <laughs> yeah. and I now heard people that. Are like wow I heard thanks that. a lot like the sound is better so you know just start hey, and i love that you brought that up yeah just start I have so many people say, I want to do what you do, but I need to save up for this really expensive camera, really expensive mic. I'm like, dude, I got to a million followers. The videos that got me to a million followers on YouTube, I did on this phone. Not even the back camera, which is better because I could see myself. I used the front camera yeah. well, because I, I didn't have anyone film for me. So I used, the, too. I used the back. Yeah, I used the, I used the same thing yeah. so I can make sure I'm like in the frame and everything like that. Speaking of which, you right. so, so yes. fast. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I, I am, I am blessed in that. You're living proof. Yeah, right. And well, you are too. People. December, so 250,000. We, we don't have to play the greed game. We don't have to play the tricky thumbnail game. We can help. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it'll work out. Yeah. And I didn't know that was true, to be honest. My, my thumbnails aren't good. <laughs> I, there was a yeah. time when I thought, oh, if I, if I give all this data away, then no one will sign up for, you know, and it's just, it doesn't work out like that. You get what you give. Right. Absolutely. So if someone wants to start, someone listen to this entire podcast, by the way, thank you for listening to this entire podcast. Um, someone wants to start, they're hyped up. Where can they start? Um, you, I know you have a website. Um, is there any, like either your website, your program, anything they can start doing today and start doing right now, they're hyped yeah. up that they don't have to live in pain. What should they do? All right. So do the first two steps of my system, which one is 10 minute is going for a 10 minute backward walk three days a week. That's actually the warm up before the body weight phase. So you just walk backwards for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Go to some place where it's safe and flat that you're not going to Ideally run into on people. a plank with mm -hmm. a shark, you know, <laughs> just a shark pool. And then you're on, no, obviously, yeah, somewhere safe. Right, right. I'm just saying, like people, you know, you're walking backwards. So you don't want to step into a pothole or this or, you know. Yeah. Um, and, then in, and then the next right. program, we start dragging a sled. Just for reference, someone might have a gym. Maybe they have a sled. Maybe they have something they can drag. The first program, we do 10 mm -hmm. minutes backward walking. And then we go into a tibialis raise, which if you look at yesterday's YouTube video, if you search tibialis raise on my YouTube channel, it shows exactly how to do it with no equipment. I show how to do it with equipment. I show how to makeshift with a $10 band. And then I show how to start it, which we actually prefer starting the first 12 weeks body weight because the nature of the movement as you'll see in this video, the nature of the movement is it kind of teaches you how that muscle works. You're getting to envision like how this is helping you get more protected in life. And uh, the burn is tremendous from doing a perfect form set of 25 reps on it. The video, you can scan on the video and see where you see me with my body weight only doing it. All you need is a wall. So even if you couldn't do the walking backwards, even if it was raining outside, all you would need is a wall and you could do two sets of 25 reps in the tibialis raise three days a week and start start putting some money in the bank for more protected knees. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's a great place for people to start. Uh, what is your website for people that want to go to that? ATGOnlineCoaching.com. So the business name, as I mentioned earlier, Athletic Truth Group. I didn't want it to be about me. So it's not mm -hmm. my name. It's not about me. We now have dozens mm -hmm. of coaches around the world. It's, you know, it's about teamwork makes the dream work. And again, if you see where I'm getting the data from, it's not just me making stuff up. It's trying to find the outlier cases of the most longevity, the most bulletproofing and seeing what they did. So that was the concept was an athletic truth group where we wouldn't have any ego. If I'm wrong, I correct it. You know what I mean? So atgonlinecoaching.com. Or kneesovertoesguy.com. Or kneeability.com because she made all these different ones. So she's smart. So it goes to our website. Right. See, that's where she's 
she's a genius and I would never think of that. Right, so right, right. He's over toastguy.com. It goes to atgonlinecoaching.com. So she's because to me, I'm like, I, who's going right, to remember right. ATG I never online thought coaching of this. .com. I'm like, I wouldn't remember that. She if does a million. Told me. <laughs> she does a million things. So you can, <laughs> you can rest assured our customer service, our coaching. I mean, the service is like tremendous, like the value you get for your dollar. Uh, we're obsessive about that. So it's pretty cool. No long-term contract half off for the first month with no long-term contract. And you get to see all my programs. There's no, like, you don't have to like do something right. to then see the next, you can literally see every workout in my system, seven different programs. Um, cause we have a body weight phase and then, or sorry, six different programs. We have a body weight phase building up with gradual, you know, additional load and then actual, like, you know, full strength and then like an off season pro athlete, but it's all, it's all there, all the numbers and sets and reps. And then, 2475 for your first month at half off, which you could even cancel if you wanted. The goal is creating a, a long-term route. So someone can actually like, you know, you could change your biology, you know, in a year's time. That's the goal. Absolutely. And that makes a lot of sense. I you have my full endorsement. The guy who says, don't let other people sell you your own happiness says, this is a worthwhile product. I like, <laughs> this is a, definitely, I don't have any really, I don't really have any pain, but this is definitely something that I would and check the knowledge, out, especially and the knowledge is on YouTube. Please go yeah, check it out. Yeah. And the knowledge right. is on YouTube. It's not like there's nothing held back in terms of the knowledge. And Instagram. Uh, where are you? Where can people find you? Instagram, YouTube. Knees over TikTok. toes guy. Yep. Knees over toes guy and Instagram. Knees over toes guy. Actually, here's a great tip for people. Make your YouTube okay. video use part of that day's filming for Instagram and TikTok. I've never made a, an original TikTok post. I've never made an original TikTok okay. post. It's just the leftover footage from trying to make my video. And I have 260,000 TikTok followers. So it takes me 10 seconds to just go repost. Cool. You get my point is that you don't have to, yeah, you don't have to sell content. your soul. Recycle you don't content. have to sell your soul or, so, you know what I mean? Try to make the most helpful video and you can take pieces of that for Instagram and TikTok. That's what I do. I, I do the same thing. I do the same thing um, for different platforms, for different platforms, for sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on. That really helped a lot of people, I think. I was enthralled the whole time. I am kind of a dork. I don't even try to hide it because there's no point in trying to hide it. Um, but I, I was enthralled the whole time. Is there anything you want to leave off? Anything you want to sign off with? I was going to say, you can also check out the Athletic Truth Group Instagram page. That, to see other people, to see other people's successes okay. and, you know, just to see it's not just me and Ben. Um, yeah. 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 I base my, and I think it's another good, you know, role for, pe for people where I would sign off would be, you know, try to base your life on how many people you help. So I keep track of every like chronic condition that changes for someone like very, you know, that they get a real success story. So I'm at 200, 2003 knee success stories. That's my worth. My worth is not measured in okay. money or anything else. My worth is, 2003 knee success stories. That's where I'm at. So hopefully when we do another one, I'll have my worth will be even higher. Right. Well, I'm sure it will be. Um, I'm excited to do another one. I'm excited to do another one. I'd be happy to do another podcast with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um,